All right, good morning everybody. Um, I'd like to start with a slight delay already, so let's get going. I'm very happy that we could attract so many of you this early Saturday morning and despite heavy socializing in the evenings. So welcome to our session, uh, which is called Between Landing Site and Vicus, Between Emporium and Town, Framing the Early Medieval Urban Development. And that is a session co-organized by my dear colleagues, uh, Robin Fleming, sitting here in the front row, and Dries um, next to her. So that, that was our idea to uh, work a little about that topic, which is quite particular, as you understand. And the idea you can see in the abstract book to that session was to highlight these faces which are so uh, hardly visible when we talk about urbanism. Um, when we talk about the urban development, I mean, that's one of the most basic topics in early medieval uh, research, uh, maybe next to the introduction of Christianity. Um, and how we should address these sites in comparison to the high medieval town stand. And as you are all aware of, there's <coughs> decades of publications, discussions about what to call those sites. Uh, Polani, Ports of Trade, we can mention early towns, Port of Towns, Viking Age towns, towns of the Viking Age, you really name it. Uh, but these sites uh, are in a way, in the debate, restricted to certain time periods of their being only. And we wanted to focus um, on the sites which formed their very beginning and also their final phases uh, because we do believe that we treat those sites uh, far too long as monolithic entities uh, which in fact are quite dynamic beings. So that was the idea to that session. So um, instead of looking at the mostly the best preserved mid-phase of the urban development at our early town spot of towns, uh, which we often uh, maybe take as a representative for the site as a whole, we would like to these inconspicuous phases of the urban development, meaning the inception phases and the latest uh, medieval structures on those sites. In order to widen our understanding about uh, the dynamics of the early urbanism, all right, when we take a short look at uh, today's program, you're aware of that's a full day session with many, many fine papers. Uh, I try to sort them a little, and here you have this color coding, because um, we have a few topics um, or, or papers which actually refer directly to our original idea to, to look at these faces. But since uh, we are one of the few sessions obviously dealing with urbanism. We get a lot of other papers which somehow fit to that. So I try to sort them a little. So we start out with uh, the papers directly referring to the session topic. Then we have a huge group of papers dealing with urbanism in rather general terms, I'd say. Um, and then we uh, turn to more bioarchaeological aspects. That is the uh, formerly the session TH122, uh, which um, joined in to ours. Uh, from there, we take it to crafts and uh, further on to networks and social practice. So that's how we try to uh, make sense of the program. And then I, of course, want to refer to a nice poster, which is also part of our session. I hope it's still there. I've seen it already two days ago, um, hanging there on on the side. So. If you have the time in the break, uh, please check out this, this poster as well, which is also a part of this program. Okay, so far for the introduction, and since we had a slight delay, I might um, as well um, jump to the first paper, which is actually mine, um, and will directly refer <laughs> to the topic we were thinking to treat also, and that is the emergence and the downfall of Viking towns, the elusive faces, um, the concealed faces within the archaeological record, I've chosen to call it. And uh, 
talking about Viking towns in, in Scandinavia, of course you are all aware of the huge body of publications we deal with for the four acknowledged sites actually which are generally accepted being among these early towns in contrast to other sites which were maybe minor or not that significant as those four and that is namely Birka to the upper left the publications there then we have of course Riebe upper right Kaupang uh, lower left and then the Hedebu publication series finally and for those of you who haven't seen the book published uh, at Christmas last year, I don't know if I have a mouse pointer, yes, that one down here, written in German, but I really, really recommend you to check that book out because it has more than a thousand illustrations about the excavations and, and had artifacts, uh, features, so even if you don't get a word of the German, it's still worth taking a look at it. All right, but that is the, the background we're dealing with. A quite nice and um, comprehensive body of publications. And besides the four, the acknowledged towns and or proto towns in Scandinavia, or of course Riebe, with that reconstruction drawing everybody knows uh, by mind. Then uh, turning to the Baltic, a little bit more south to that, we have of course Hedeby. That's the picture we recall when we think of those sites. Uh, then uh, Kaupang in the Oslo Fjord, and finally Birka. But is that really all to the story? Of course not. But uh, I also want to draw the attention to that all the four or three pictures, at least reconstructional drawings here, are made by the same guy, uh, Fleming Bau. So that's even one artist which creates our imagination about how the sites look like, similar to this, similar to this except that one which is the model in the uh, Stardust Historisk Museum in Stockholm. Right, but when we talk about this, I tried to come up with a quite bad timeline here, I have to admit, but um, if we agree on that the Vikings towns emerged somewhat between, I don't know, 750s, let's say, and they furnish uh, uh, a stop existing around 975, maybe had to be a little later. Well, it's a really huge time period. Uh, it's about 10 generations, if we take a generation with 30, 30 years each. And huge, huge events and changes taking also place, starting with the sex wars, I put it up here in very tiny green, uh, coronation of Charlemagne in 800, Treaty of Verdun, the Danelag, Discovery of Iceland, Kiev and Ruth Foundation, Rollo and Normandy, Bishop Briggs and Hedeby, Rieben, Aarhus, the baptism of her Bluetooth, the discovery of Vinland, the Danish North Sea Empire, and finally Stamford Bridge in Hastings. So it's a huge, huge time frame, many, many events taking place. How can we assume that the towns in that period are staple entities and are not affected by this <coughs> massive, massive changes taking place? And I brought you the example of Hedeby, which has, of course, the best preservation conditions in Scandinavia, that's a picture of the 30s, the excavation, you recognize the small creek, which is somewhat central to the whole settlement. And then in the upper right, you can see the dendrochronological data gained from that superb preservation. And if we say had we existed about, let's say, 750 and 1050, or if we take the historical date, 1066, and compare that to the information we have based on dendrochronology, we see it's only the 9th century. It's only the 9th century which is there, giving us information about the structural development. So we miss out the very start, and we miss out the second part of the town's existence, more or less. And that is a quite interesting observation, I would say. And of course, the early phases are hard to trace, always, because you have somewhat large structures, about 12 hectares, maybe 24 in the case of Hedeby, and to find the, the origins, the small nucleus below this layer package of two to three meters is really the needle and the haystack. And to come up with something like that, uh, like in Hedeby, that you have plow marks actually all below the settlement layers, it's quite, uh, quite a lucky, lucky incident to be able to say so. Right, and the latest phases, of course, in town development are affected 
by modern constructions. You can see that on the left hand side by Renfrew and Barn, this uh, graphic about how urban development affects an archaeological site, and that is luckily, in case of the Viking towns, only uh, the case for Riebe. But you can see that the, the latest excavations by Morton Sursu close to the cathedral, quite important actually because he could uh, prove that's probably that very site where Ansgar had his church. Um, and Riebe on the opposite side of the trading place, but how modern uh, town development affects uh, the latest phases of such sites we would uh, like to address archaeologically in the Viking Age. And uh, as I said, the other sites, Kaupang, Birka, Hedebu, are open for, for archaeological undertakings, which is great, but um, even here you have heavy effects of uh, destruction you have to recall. Uh, on the right hand side you have Kaupang and there you have heavy bioturbation so you not have even one complete house and it's really really tricky to sort it out. You have the long fire, you have sometimes the benches and that's it. So heavily destroyed. And on the other hand even a site like Hedeby with that preserving conditions which are so superb you have destructions by modern plowing and this is immediately underneath uh, the grass turf and you can see that it's plowed out hearth probably directly under the grass surface. So that's the faces which are so elusive, uh, but are nonetheless very important. I'd like to start uh, with some words on the exception phase, uh, the emergence of Viking towns, and I really would like to make the point that I personally believe that they all develop from ordinary landing sites, uh, which is the common pattern in Scandinavia, which is a maritime society, you know maybe the study of Jens Ulriksen from Roskilde on Ennepsplässe, that is uh, landing sites connected to beach markets, something like this. So I think that's the most ordinary pattern we have in Scandinavia. But then uh, the royal power kicks in and there's no quotation, I personally believe, which is as important as the Royal Frankish Annals from 808, saying that the King uh, Göttrich destroyed a trading place on the seashore in Danish called Rerik, which, because of the taxes it paid, was of great advantage to his kingdom. Transferring the merchants from Reyek, he weighed anchor and came with the whole army to the harbor of Sliestop, which is Hedebu. So it's about uh, kings taking uh, advantage because of the taxes they could gain on already existing sites, or else destroying sites which are kind of concurrence to, to their sites they want to uh, forward. So I think that's really the beginning to it. And the most prime example we have, of course, where we can see that very, very clearly is Riebe, where you have at the left-hand side the annual layering of the um, marketplace, then you have the town plots in the center, and even this administrative boundary, this legal boundary, encircling the marketplace of that beach market. So here it's quite clear. But even in Kaupang, in the latest publications by uh, Dawkins Grace project, uh, they came up with a site period um, uh, sequence and it's quite interesting because site period 3 is only exists in terms of artifacts but otherwise it's the plow horizon and that's the latest phase so hardly uh, not existing in terms of um, features actually and then we have the site period 2 which is the best preserved and then we have something which is probably a seasonal occupation which would fit to a beach market activity there only five to ten years or so but it's there, it's there. Uh, what about the other two sites then when we talk about uh, Birka in uh, Lake Mälaren we, we have a horizon of stray finds from the Black Earth to the left hand side which are of late Wendell period origin and we have even three pure uh, Wendell period graves among all the thousand graves situated on the island. So there is activity before the Viking Age, before the advent of Birke as a town. And Birgit Arrhenius already in 76 published a paper based on the uh, three graves you've just seen, pointing out that there might be farmsteads which are uh, there before the town of Birke, which is situated <coughs> here in Bustan, that's the Black Earth area, um, will appear. There's another place here which is called Urmknus, and there you have the only monumental burial mounds, actually, which are also of the same time period. So there's something uh, going on before that. And uh, when we jump to, to the town rampart of Birka, here, 
you have quite a series of house terraces to the innermost part. Here you have the very ground hemland then, and here a, a house ground could be excavated uh, from the late Vandal period uh, and the famous Moose Man also under the threshold to that building. So that might be farmsteads actually connected to Beach Market before Birka became the Viking town we know it. Uh, jumping to Hedeby, as I said, we have this superb wooden preservation, uh, but it's rather covering the 9th century. When you want to check out the origins to that, that is all the timber we have in the excavations for the time 828 and before that. <coughs> so the suggestion of my colleague Joachim Schulz was that the town development in the central area just started with a bridge over the creek, which dates actually to 890, and from then onwards uh, we have the town development. Historically, you recall 808, merchants transferred from Rerig to Hedeby. But even here we have a horizon of uh, Vendel, late Vendel period artifacts from metal detecting. We have what I've chosen to call a Nudam plank. It's a boat plank dated to around or after 749 from the harbor. So beach market activities, even the excavator, Kutschitzis, in his very special way, describes had to be started by the arrival of individual persons or small groups whose business was in trade and craft, and for that reason were applying for temporary acceptance. Well, that's a complicated sentence, but I think he talks about a beach market. Um, right. Uh, the southern settlement in Hedeby is always discussed as being the origin to the settlement, so it's situated <laughs> south of the semicircular rampart in that area, and it's uh, many, many pet houses. Later, this area is used when the rampart is built as a, a burial ground, and there's actually one building feature uh, apart from the pit houses uh, in the very south, down here, and that is a subsidiary building only, obviously. So, uh, which requires a big hall, and that is not my idea, I have to say, but uh, my colleague Volker Hilberg, and he said, well, here's quite some space for a big hall, which you can't see archaeologically, because the post holes might be gone, we just see the pet houses. So that is also something we have to take into consideration, that might be also a farmstead, which is the origin, to head it then, later on. And we have the hill for the Hochburg, where we excavated some years ago, and even here you have about 70 graves, which died in, in the mid of the 7th century already. So there's something going on before the town becomes a town. Right, some few words to, to the downfall of the Viking towns. Um, I'd like to refer to a study which I really, really found enlightening. That is uh, by Charlotte Hillerdahl from uh, Uppsala Universität. And she says, well, when we talk about the end of these proto-towns, we uh, have to get rid of the functionalistic explanations, like change in trade routes, new developments in shipping, and so on and so forth. But she says it's rather about a politi uh, political conflict going on between a strengthened oil power and largely autonomous urban dwellers. So that's that conflict. The merchants getting too powerful, not fitting in uh, in what the king necessarily wants to. So here we have really a... a a conflict, and uh, towns may be consciously being destroyed in order to fit in into the hierarchical order of the king himself. And there might be one example from, from Birka, where we have the famous garrison uh, on the map here. You can see here would be the hill for Borian in Birka, and here you have the garrison house. Many, many, many arrowheads, um, more or less contemporary, and that is interpreted as an attack on Birka, which might uh, determine the end of that site, maybe even by, by the king himself. Right, but what uh, Charlotte Hilladal doesn't say so explicitly, she's kind of vague when uh, talking about the end to the site, saying generally around the turn of the first millennium or by the early 11th century. And uh, I think it's important to make uh, that note here that Kaupang uh, <coughs> and Birka, all right, with ceased to exist around 975. About Riebe we don't know yet about the uh, continuation since it's an existing town in our days too, but Hedeby as a site in comparison to Kaupang and Birka exists 100 years longer than Birka and Kaupang and I think we have to address that. Why is that? Why could Hedeby survive so much longer than the other towns? Three and a half generations again which would cover that. That's the layer in the plough horizon without ploughed earth. 
And I believe uh, there's considerable changes just in that period. Hedebu is always connected to the uh, Danewerk uh, fortifications, but it's lying in the borderlands in front of the Danewerk. Uh, and when uh, the uh, connective wall is built and the semicircle rampart and phase two and three, it becomes a part of that boundary line. But it's lying in the boundary, in the no man's land between the Saxons or the Germans later on and the Danish. And it's only around uh, 800, uh, 980 when the Kovjeke is added as a linear structure <coughs> that the town falls behind the border. So, and I think here we can see the change from the free trade zone to the transformation into a royal Danish town. Uh, we have the geomagnetics in Hedeby uh, conducted in 2002, I believe, and we have this odd structure here, that's the shoreline, that's the major excavation trenches, which is about a row, probably, going through the whole settlement and meeting the bridge we've just seen. And you have strong anomalies here and plot-like lines going from that anomalies. And the interpretation is that we deal with workshops, because here in 1913 a workshop was excavated. Uh, which is on the towards the road on these plots and you would expect more houses in the back to the workshops which is a pattern which we know quite well from Sigtun actually uh, which is the successor of Birka um, and here we have a quite distinct royal presence in the middle of the town and the plots here and later on only 100 years later we have a very strong ecclesiastical structure next to the uh, royal court which moved a little but you have that town pattern here which I believe we can see in Hedebu so maybe we have actually a Sigtuna face in Hedebu and that would be quite interesting because as you can see here it would require actually a royal court and it would require churches and we'd have no clue about that um, but there are some sus suspicious finds nobody could properly explain and that is a church bell from the harbour basin of Hedebu uh, which might actually refer to those churches in their Sigtuna face. And we have the royal longship, the longship of Herod Bluetooth. What does the king do in the town if we know that they are always set next to it but apart, like in Kaupang and Skiringsorde, Birka, Adelsu? What does the king do in this town? So maybe that might be an argument for having a royal presence in the town in the latest phase, which you can see so badly. And of course, you could argue uh, that, well, Sigtuna is so much later than my suggestion for Hedebu around 1906, 980 would imply. But of course it's not a, a Swedish invention, it's not a Danish invention, this town pattern, but I think in order to sort these developments out we have to look to the continent. And there we have something like that, where the are and again the same plot layout. That's uh, so much from my side and uh, yeah, thank you for and your attention.